This, this is a, certainly a somber Earth Day given the uh, events of last week. I, I know we're all thinking about uh, the people of, of West the, who lost their lives, first responders and others, those injured. And you know, to that end, I, I thought we should begin our discussion with the situation at, at West. And, and Chairman Shaw, I'd, I'd like to start, start off with you. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of questions that, that people have about this situation in terms of, you know, how could a fertilizer plant be located so close to a city? You know, what is the, the regulatory history concerns of this plant? How did this explosion happen? And there's obviously an investigation ongoing. I'm, I'm wondering if you uh, have learned anything, you know, sort of new over the weekend about what might have happened that you can share with us and, and also how this, this sort of investigation unfolds from TCEQ's perspective. Sure, and, and thank you for the, the chance to talk about this issue. One, certainly it is indeed a, a tragedy. As you look at several of the, the, let me back up and start with where the process is. You know, we're really in the beginning stages of investigating what happened. Uh, we started, you know, after the event happened, the first and primary goal is trying to secure the area, make sure that the responders and the public are safe, and then trying to re rescue anyone that could be saved at that point, and then moved into the recovery phase. And that wrapped up, um, I guess Saturday really was the last where they were through with the recovery component. And that sort of started in earnest, the opportunity to start assessing what happened as well as starting to assess what the environmental impacts might be associated with that to, and, and so, for example, when I was up Friday, we were in the processes of starting to evaluate how we're going to go about assessing, you know, what are the things we need to be looking for, what are the things we need to be concerned about to make sure people aren't in harm's way. So all of that said, if, if you look back at some of the questions that have been asked, and, and, and I have to say it's been a bit concerning that on the heels of the tragedy, there were a number of, of articles that were suggesting that this is a failure of environmental regulations or regulation in general. We still had we still had bodies that hadn't been recovered at that point. So it wasn't the right time for that. We're getting there. Uh, specifically, as you look at what is happening and what we know and what have you, um, uh, the the facility located near town, actually when it was built in I think '62, was built about a mile, mile north of town, and so town grew up around it. And the reason that's important is because we want to make sure we look at what other situations are out there and we understand what other potential tragedies there are that need to be avoided. Uh, furthermore, it, it's also, uh, we have many of these hundreds of facilities like this across the state. And fortunately, they don't explode very often. In fact, if you look at this, while we know there are dangers inherent to some of the materials that are handled in these facilities, we don't see these explosions often. And it points us to the, the, what I started off with, that we need to make sure we let the, the investigation understand what happened so that we can make decisions so we solve the right problem. Uh, for example, while it's been suggested that maybe there's not enough inspection occurring, um, the environmental community doesn't have the safety responsibility. That's, that's other agencies that are involved with that, specifically the Office of the Texas State Chemist, and there's a federal agency, the U.S. Uh, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Administration. It's my understanding that the Texas State Chemist was there 12 times last year. And so what we need to make sure is that we know what to look forward to or what we look for going forward in that this doesn't happen that often. What was unique about this situation? Is there some new component that's there, some new situation that we can avoid? Um, or is it something we need to, uh, to look very strongly about saying there's, there's this hazard that can't be mitigated, therefore we need to make sure we separate these from people. But that's premature to get to that point. Uh, we just know that this was a, a tragedy that was different than we've seen before, and the investigation will, will lead us to that point where we can understand what happened, and then we can answer those questions. And, and I think there will be a very rigorous review about what to learn from what happened in this case. Now, Jim, one of your colleagues at, at Environmental Defense Fund, Elena Kraft, uh, wrote a blog post uh, entitled, Explosion at Texas Plant Renews uh, Concerns About State Environmental Agency, you know, is this is this a, a, an environmental Texas environmental regulatory uh, uh, failure or concern, or is it an, an OSHA occupational safety and health uh, concern? Where we, we still don't know what happened. Yes, and yes. Um, let me uh, apologize a little bit for my tone today. I don't normally speak in the words I'm going to use, but the deaths in West Texas are a little personal with me. For 30 years, uh, every fall, I drive 
to see my beloved horned frogs play football in, in uh, Fort Worth. And invariably, I stop at the check shop in West Texas. These are the nicest people in the world. And I believe because of failure of state government, people are dead now. Maybe it's the people in that check shop, or it's certainly their sons, or their daughter, or their sons, or their, their husbands. And we've got to do something. Um, we don't know everything right now, but we know certain things. Uh, number one, we know this is not the first accident. No, they don't blow up every day, but they happen. We have accidents in Texas way too often. We lead the nation in fatal industrial accidents. We got to do something about this and do something more than go to, to funerals. It's time to stop. These accidents happen in, in recent years in Texas City twice and Waxahachie and in Bryan. We just stop it. And this is what we know about the environmental side. They got a grandfather. That's the first thing we should have never done, grandfather this plant. They uh, were, had a permit, temporary permit in 2004. They were supposed to come in to get another permit. They never did. The state agency did nothing about it. Never came and shut them down, never went in and got a court order. They kept operating since 2004. That's the permitting side. And so the legislature is looking at permitting right now. And guess what they're doing? There's bills zipping through the legislature to make it easier to get a permit without proper review. Uh, doing away with the contested case hearing, or at least the key parts of it, doing away with the key parts of the compliance history. I'm sorry, these things have results. Let's talk about the inspection. Last time the agency was out there was 2006. That was because when we had a complaint. Uh, the agency doesn't go out and inspect generally these kind of facilities unless there's a complaint. Other states like New Jersey go regularly. Look for problems and fix problems in advance. Don't go after the, after the fact and figure out what happened. They stop things. Now, I don't think the people at TCEQ are evil or doing this on purpose, but they don't have enough resources. And a lot of us in this room have been quiet while we've been cutting the, the muscle from our regulatory agencies. When Chairman Shaw took office in uh, 2008, seven, that's right, the budget for TCEQ was 480, operating budget was 480 something million dollars, 487 million, I think. Last year it was 357 million. We've gained over two and a half million people during that time. We don't have enough inspectors we don't have enough ability to do permits right. The commission's not asking for enough money. And frankly, the environmental community is not raising hell enough about this. People are dying, low taxes, and, and the, business, the friendly business community means we're not doing our job and their consequences. I'm sorry, I like those people in West Texas. Somebody needs to say, the emperor has no clothes, and I'm going to start doing that today. I'm sorry. This is this one. Chairman Shaw, um, um, he raised he raised a lot of issues. Sure. One thing we we uh, should talk about maybe is the the budgeting situation. Do you have enough people at, at sure. TCQ? According to a, a story I just read in the Houston Chronicle, um, um, you lost uh, 235 full-time employees uh, in the budget cuts last last session, you know, that's got to cut in some ways. Do you have enough people to, uh, should we have more people? Should we be going to these types of facilities more, more often? Let me try to clear the air a little bit. I, and I love the people in West as well. And I, I looked the mayor in the eye and, and talked to a man who's lost, at that time he knew he had lost five of his volunteer fire department members and five other were in the hospital. I've seen that suffering. We, a number of us love that town and love those people. They are the salt of the earth. But let's be fair. If we really want to solve that issue, sending in the wrong kind of inspectors won't change this. We can talk about whether, and I will address the issue about whether or not we need more inspectors. 
my inspectors don't go there looking for safety issues because it's not part of what our responsibility is. If it becomes our responsibility, we will. As I understand, and we work cooperatively with the Texas State Chemist and others, they're the ones that have that responsibility. They were there 12 times, is my understanding, 12 times last year. So either there's something that they're not missing, or, I mean, not seeing, there's some unique situation that occurred, there's something there that didn't stand out during those 12 visits. And so if they'd gone 24, if they're not knowing what to look for, that wouldn't have changed things. We need to find out what really happened so that we can identify how to stop this from happening in the future. This, this is not a, a tragedy that occurred because they had an ammonia tank that was regulated. In fact, I would submit to you that the ammonia tank that's been a lot of people's focus was likely not what we saw exploding there. And it's more likely, as I've done some in, uh, analysis of that, that it's likely uh, possibly even a rail car with ammonium nitrate in it. That's early, early, just looking at some of the visual studies. Those issues, when we find out what that is, will help us to identify whether this is a plant inspection process or if this is a transportation process. Is this something we need to look at where rail cars are being stored near facilities? That's speculation, but at this point, everything is speculation. And until we know what the real cause of the problem is, we can suggest that we make lots of changes, but if we're doing the wrong things, we're just spinning our wheels and missing the opportunity to really prevent tragedies like this from occurring in the future. Now, with regard to the budget cuts, uh, yes, we, we took a, a very significant budget cut and we lost employees. The key thing that we've tried to focus on is ensuring that we were able to accomplish our core function, the core missions, and be able to be as responsible as possible. I think if you see the, uh, the challenges that we've seen with regard to the, the development of shell and the, and the number of inspectors we needed to have first in the Barnett shell area, and now looking at the, the expansive growth and uh, exploration out in the West Texas area and the, the Eagleford shell, uh, we've managed to uh, prioritize what we do. Uh, could we use more inspectors? Always. There's, there's, there's going to be a trade-off there. You look at what budgets allow, and, and part of what we've tried to ensure, and we were successful working with the legislature when we, when we went through sunset review last session, was to give us the flexibility so that we didn't just take across the board uh, per, uh, staffing cuts, but we were able to target where we move people around so that we could in, indeed ensure that we're able to meet those core functions. And, and I think we've managed to, to do that well. We continue to try to ad adapt new technologies to make our inspectors go further using things like our cameras and others where we can be more efficient and effective. Uh, and so we're going to continue to, to work with the legislature to make sure they're aware of what the challenges are. And, and I think we're, we're finding a reasonable balance. Each of us would probably decide we need more or less depending on how you value the cost associated with those more inspectors. Um, but we, West was not a failure because we didn't have enough inspectors to go out. It, it's, it's a matter of th that's not in our area that we're working, that we're directly responsible for, and we cooperate with others. We need to identify what those real problems were and then figure out how best to fix them. What, what is the budgeting situation of TCQ this, this session? I'm, I'm actually not, not up on it. The, the uh, of course, the, the, it's not over yet, but the, the way not it looks at it. this point was, um, we're likely to see about flat level from the standpoint of, of FTEs. There are a couple of bills that would, in, would, would, inc would replace some FTEs with regard to the Texas Environmental Redu or in, in Emissions Reduction Program, the TERP program. And so uh, there's a possibility we'll see some uh, increase there, as well as increasing the, the TERP funding, and so uh, as well as a few other items. But on, the, on the base core functions, we're looking at similar levels to what we had in the last session with the exception of uh, possibly adding some additional back to help with the TERP program administration and getting those grants out to reduce emissions in, in that program. Jim, did you? Well, all I'd say is if uh, after 2004, when the, the company did not come in as required uh, for a, a renewal of the permit, the agency had acted affirmatively, they probably would have shut them down because they didn't have a, a valid permit. They were, quote, unclassified. Uh, missed, missed opportunity. Uh, unclassified, and, and there's a lot of, of misunderstanding and confusion about what goes. Unclassified has to do with a lot of when you don't have enough data on a, on a situation. We have those mean things based on, we try to make sure that they're uniform and so that you treat all facilities uh, equitably. And they were grandfathered not because we thought it was a good idea to grandfather them. They were grandfathered because we didn't have those types of permitting authorities prior to, and they were already built whenever those authorities came into place. And what is often done, in fact, the federal government still has grandfathered facilities because 
facilities that exist before the federal requirements come into play are grandfathered. Uh, this state was proactive in doing away with some of those grandfather facilities, and while they didn't come into that in, in the uh, in immediately when they should have, there's a lot of educational learning curve there, and they have been in compliance since 2007 with that. And again, let's keep our eye on the ball. Anhydrous ammonia leak is not what caused the explosion at this point. It doesn't appear, and if, even if it were, it wasn't. That regulation would not have have or, uh, investigations, what have you, aren't looking for what happened in this case. So we're, we're uh, trying to make sure we use our resources effectively, but anhydrous ammonia and that leak at that time were two separate things from this tragedy we see now. Okay. Um, Laura, let me bring you into the conversation here and maybe uh, 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 pull it over to some other things here. What, I, I'd like to hear what, what you're uh, interested in in terms of uh, legislation this, this session. What, what bills are you watching? Well, Especially. the most important bill that we've got our eye on, it's a set of bills, has to do with funding the state water plan. Um, and, you know, I appreciate this conversation and what you all are saying. I understand the investigation is underway. Jim, I'm sympathetic with your um, passion for this issue. If, you know, to pull the cameras back a little bit and think about what are the big issues facing the state, certainly if we're going to have a regulatory framework, we've got to fund the agency in order to perform those functions. But if you're talking to an organization like mine, the Nature Conservancy, where we're thinking in terms of natural resource protection, there's just no doubt in my mind that the single biggest challenge we face as a state is making sure that we've got fresh, clean, available water supplies for cities that are growing by leaps and bounds, energy and industry that's growing to support those cities, and a very, very significant agricultural uh, um, business in the state. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we provide those resources in such a way that keeps the rivers and streams and lakes and aquifers in Texas clean and productive and supporting healthy ecological systems. So there are a whole slew of bills moving through the system right now to fund what's called the state water plan. What I think is interesting about these bills, and by the way, we would not have imagined this a decade ago, is that of the $2 billion that is, uh, is being created or taken from the Rainy Day Fund, 20% of this is being dedicated to conservation and reuse. And our community of environmentalists and conservationists and those people that care about the protection of the natural resources of our state, we wouldn't have imagined that kind of investment um, even a decade ago. And in some of these bills, there's an additional 10%. Now we're still talking about 20% of $2 billion and an additional 10% of $2 billion that would fund rural projects, but also, interestingly, agricultural conservation. And I just want to say that, you know, if you're looking at the biggest block of water use in the state of Texas, it is agricultural water use. And so I think it's really significant that we've got a block of money that could be allocated to finding ways to make that the most efficient use of water that we have in the state. So all of these bills moving through, I think, certainly represent the most significant funding um, priority that the state is considering. If you pair that with the transportation bills that are um, also being looked at, there is some significant investment in infrastructure in Texas. And you're, you're optimistic that it's, these bills will sort of continue to hold their shape through, through the rest of this process? <laughs> well, I am an optimist, but uh, there's still a, a little over a month left. I'm actually optimistic because I see that, at least on the water bills, it's not just money moving through the system, because that would not be as interesting to us, because the state water plan um, is an infrastructure plan. What I like about it is that it is taking into consideration and it's funding policy priorities that recognize we're not just going to build our way out of this. We're going to have to look at the number one, you know, most effective, cheapest strategy of them all is going to be conservation. We're going to have to look at how we're going to handle conservation in growing cities and in energy and industry and in agriculture. Nobody gets off the hook. So I do like the policy, and I think the shape of the policy is going to stay intact. Jim, what are you all watching at, at EDF in terms of legislation, sort of top, top priorities I think there are the session? Uh, three areas. One is uh, trying to defeat the many bills that are aimed at dramatically harming the oversight of, of government of industrial facilities, whether it's compliance history on uh, with regard to fines or making it easier to slide through permits without proper oversight. Uh, number two, there are some uh, good affirmative bills on energy that we ought to do, and we ac actually ought to pass even if we didn't care about air pollution because they'll, they'll save money. Uh, things like demand response and, and uh, other clean energy. And then third is 
the water side. I will say there are good things in the bill. Uh, frankly, there's some things we need to do more. Uh, unlike other states who are putting a, aside uh, a lot of money for mitigation <coughs> by the fact that we're, we're going to have a lot of uh, impacts from what appears to be the new normal that we're going to have a lot less rain in most places and when it does rain sadly it's going to rain really hard in other places. Uh, a lot of other states are planning for that. Uh, we don't yet have very much of that in our water plan. We need to add, add it to that. Mm -hmm. I, I want to circle back to that but uh, Chairman Shaw is there besides, besides the budget which we've talked about is there anything that you all at TCEQ are particularly keeping your, your eye on? There are several issues that are that were obviously in some of which were mentioned here and, and I'd like to, to comment on, on the water side of things especially uh, in part of what Laura was talking about was regard to uh, looking at conservation and, and agriculture being components of that process. I, I think she's absolutely correct that it is uh, a unique and a positive approach that we're recognizing that we need to build new uh, sources but also recognize the cheapest is going to be looking at conservation and building agriculture in is one of those that I have a, a lot of love for and a background in. Uh, as, as large water users there's been a lot of effort already to make water use more efficient in much of the state and there's a lot of technology out there. The benefit is, you know, some areas there may not be a lot left to do, but there's a lot of technology out there that can be expanded in its use. And oftentimes those additional technologies not only save water, but also can help to manage crops better and increase productivity. And, and we're always, I certainly am always excited when we can find ways that help to protect the environment, conserve resources, and you get there, there's an incentive there because there's an opportunity for that to be cost effective. And, and, and so I think this is a unique opportunity where you have an appreciation for the need of water and you have a, a legislature that's committed to, to funding some of those programs. And so I look forward to that being a positive outcome, hopefully, of this session. I'd be curious in your thoughts of, about the, uh, the coming summer. I mean, we mm -hmm. have uh, pretty bad forecasts, uh, right. frankly, in the state. You know, West Texas, South Texas, uh, likely to remain dry. It's very sobering. Uh, uh, there are some of these 60-day uh, uh, notices in right. the Rio Grande Valley irrigation districts running short of water. Can you, can you sure. talk a little, uh, Chairman Shaw, about what you see uh, uh, happening over the summer? Right. What, what are sort of TCEQ's points of, of real concern? You know, sure. are there some communities in particular? Right. There are uh, a number of water issues across the state varying from the, the drought and the ongoing severity of that. I think you're right, only in the northeastern part of the state are we projected to see some improvements and the rest of the state is likely to stay the same or worsen. And if you look at especially out in far west Texas, you know, Lakes Ivy and Spence and some of those small communities out there where the lake is less than 1% of capacity at this point, we, we've seen some real um, uh, hardship on those communities that have been uh, struggling with trying to maintain water in the tap. Uh, a part of the good and the bad is unfortunately and fortunately we've, we've dealt with a lot of drought recently and so our staff ha has uh, a great experience and expertise and ability to, to communicate and cooperate with our sister agencies across the state working with the Texas Water Development Board and others to identify uh, the challenges and potential solutions uh, and, and that's going to be you know, as part of what we're doing we're continuing to work with those water supplies uh, many of which I think there's uh, I have the number, but I forget it now. There's uh, four or five hundred water supplies across the state that are in some form of, of restricted watering. We're trying to make sure that we encourage them to be more proactive to start those earlier as opposed to waiting until the problem is so severe because then it's often too late to recover, especially if we don't have uh, significant rainfall and runoff for those that are uh, reliant on surface water. We're going to continue to help identify those water supplies that are in trouble, especially focusing on sole source, whether, whether they're dependent solely on surface water or groundwater. That gives them very few options if the, the surface water dries up, or in that case, or if the well goes dry. And so working out those interconnects early on, working at trying to find ways to resolve those problems, and incorporating uh, whether it's conservation and also those interconnects helps us to identify that. We're uh, blessed that we have uh, the resources to try to often help each other out, but oftentimes that can be trucking water in. Uh, those are things that are both very expensive and 
uh, very difficult to put together in short order, so we're trying to be proactive in ensuring that those uh, water supplies evaluate their system up front because every drop you save before you get into that situation and before you start running dry is, is one less that you have to scramble to come up with whenever the, the, whenever the well starts running dry, so to speak. So we're, we, we're going to work cooperatively on those and take those very seriously, but you're right that those are going to be problematic and we're going to continue praying for rain to, to help to alleviate these challenges. Yeah. Um, Laura, what, what do you see sort of unfolding this summer? Maybe you could talk, uh, uh, we just have a couple more minutes before we open it up to questions, but I would like to um, at least briefly get to the uh, uh, court case uh, last month, the um, Aransas Project uh, uh, ruling by a district judge that said Texas um, TCEQ needs to uh, sort of manage its waterways better and the, the broader implications for this state and for the um, for the health of the rivers and so on. Okay, well, uh, a couple of comments. One, we just came out of the single year drought of record a couple of years ago, and, and I said at the time, the big difference between what was happening then and what happened in the 1950s, which is considered our state's drought of record, is that there were fewer than 10 million people living in Texas in the 1950s, and now we're sitting at 25 million people in the state. So that's just a lot more straws in every single water supply we have in the state. So it should come as no surprise to anybody that crawling out of that drought isn't happening nearly as quickly as we would like for it to happen. And you combine that with the fact that we're becoming a more arid state, and I think that we've got all the information we need to start really thinking carefully about our future water supplies. I always point to conservation, and the reason I do is because fundamentally this is not going to be about supporting the same old habits with clever new supplies of water. Um, this is going to be about changing habits, and we're going to have to change them across all the sectors. We're going to have to recognize that the strategies that worked in the 1950s um, really will not support a state that has 50 or so million people in it. They just will not be effective. So when it comes to recent, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision, again, it's just the information is right before our eyes. <coughs> and so now we're even seeing lawsuits that are saying to us, look, if we don't manage these waterways well, then we're going to compromise the water quantity and we're going to compromise, we haven't talked about this, but we're going to compromise the water quality. And when we've done that, we're not going to be able to support the ecology that's natural to those systems. That's one problem that we're going to see, whooping cranes. But another problem that we're going to see is it's going to become extraordinarily expensive to treat this water for our growing cities. The dirtier it is, the more expensive it will be to treat. So, and Jim made a comment to this, I mean, I, you know, this is Earth Day, we're trying to talk about a broader set of issues. One thing that's becoming really, really clear is that green infrastructure are using um, those strategies that will proactively keep these natural resources intact, clean, and healthy makes good business sense. It is ultimately cheaper uh, to keep these systems intact than it is to fix them. It is cheaper to cultivate new water supplies out of conservation than to build a great big treatment plant um, and ship water around the state. And so I think a really, really important message that we've all established, and I don't think very many people are pushing back on this right now, is that these conservation strategies are effective and they make good business sense. And so as we look forward to a, some, another hot, dry summer in Texas, um, boy, that's going to be fun. You know, I think that at least, you know, for sure cities need to be thinking about year-round um, ordinances that restrict water use, that's going to become more and more common. And I think in all of our other sectors, um, we're just going to have to dial it back. And I will say this, because we're almost through the legislative session, but an important conversation is just starting to bubble up, and we definitely need an interim charge to start thinking more about this. And that is, what in the world are we going to do with our brackish water supplies in the state of Texas? How are they going to be regulated? How are they going to be treated? Whose water supply problems can that respond to? And I just think we're only beginning to understand how brackish water, which you know is salty but not quite as salty as uh, coastal waters, can be used in the state of Texas. Yeah, someone someone told me uh, we have an ocean of brackish water under the state of state of Texas. So that'll certainly be uh, interesting to watch watch that play out. And of course, on water, everyone should watch the U.S. Supreme Court uh, tomorrow. A big sort of uh, uh, Tarrant Regional Water District versus. Uh, Oklahoma um, uh, hearing is going to take place place there tomorrow.